Psychedelic Sundays. Psychedelic Sundays. Psychedelic Sundays. Psychedelic Sundays. Psychedelic Sundays. Welcome to the first Psychedelic Sunday show. The Entheogen Show. Entheogens are emissaries of Gaia. Their sole purpose is to speed up the evolution of consciousness. We are living in very interesting and troubling times. We can either co-destroy or co-evolve. How do we collectively dream? How do we co-create a better dream for the future of humanity? I think that our challenge and opportunity as we live in this time of convergence where there's so many worldviews and belief systems and ways of engaging with reality. Entheogens have long been used as a catalyst for spiritual and visionary experiences. Many of these, which people have reported in shamanic journeys, show similarities to those described by Jung in his exploration of the human psyche. This is especially evident in the process of individualization and integration. It could be argued that shamanism and Jungian analysis are concerned with what the shaman called the soul loss or soul retrieval, what Jung might call withdrawal of projections towards individualization. Entheogens have been and are being used in shamanic practices as catalysts for exploring inner psychic realities. These two systems are complementary and mutually enhancing in the process of individualization, which ultimately helps us to reconnect to our own deepest nature. Plant medicines can be seen as substances, but also as emissaries, whose purpose is a catalyst to the evolution of human consciousness. Entheogens are emissaries of Gaia. Their sole purpose is to speed up the evolution of consciousness. All right. So um, I'm always doing research on this topic. It's one of my favorite topics. And I had that group. It's called uh, Psychedelic Sundays. And this is actually the first ever real Psychedelic Sunday show I have done. <laughs> and anyways, during this research, I found this great poem by Rumi. And it goes like this. This is how human beings can change. The worm's addicted to eating grape leaves. Suddenly, he wakes up. Call it grace, whatever. Something wakes him up. He's no longer a worm. He's the entire vineyard, the entire orchard, the fruits, the trunk. A growing wisdom and joy that doesn't need to devour Rumi. I think this sums up for me my own personal experience that I like to tell the story of when I took shrooms on a private beach. And I suddenly uh, had the felt experience of being one with the whole entire world. And it kind of very similar to what he was he's saying about the warm up. So suddenly I, I woke up and I realized that I was the entire earth. I was one with the ocean. The um, beach beneath me was moving like a heartbeat and everything was all flowing together. And in the sense too, I, I had no longer this desire to devour. And I think that that the desire to devour is this kind of um, robotic uh, consumption that we kind of are conditioned in. And it took me a long time to start integrating a lot of what happened that, that day on that beach. And I think this is part of what we we'll really get into this talk is about our, our own personal journeys with it and our own insights and, and how we develop. But um, it finally made me want to start not devouring stuff, but starting creating stuff and starting to use these different things that I experience and capitulate that, that beauty that's the uh, kind of term that I think everybody by now has heard me say this, but I, I love it. And, uh, and it's something from Allen Ginsberg as well. The main thing in the universe is nameless. So I name it beauty. Now beauty is beauty. That's all there is to it. 
If you're interested in yourself, then you're stuck with yourself and you're stuck with your death. But if you get interested in beauty, then you launch onto something mysterious inside your soul that grows and grows like a secret of the same thought until you're it. And I think what's cool about everybody here is that on our own individual journeys, we have experienced that beauty, this eternalness of this oneness of everything. And we all take it in our different paths and process it differently but we all kind of expressed it and we all found each other in this roundabout way. So real quick, I want to uh, introduce everybody who's here. Um, we have Adam uh, Millward, who's been on the Sh Infinite Imaginarium, who's the Mandala artist. How's it going, Adam? It's going great. Thanks for having me on the show again. And we have Carolina, who actually sparked the idea for this show. When we had our, our show with her, you mentioned towards the end about ethogens. And when you use that term, uh, I kind of like lit up because there's three different terms that people use and uh, uh, psychedelics, which I, I usually use as a catch all kind of uh, term. And uh, ethogens are uh, kind of what I personally view them as, and we'll get into like the distinctions between them and uh, hallucinogens which is kind of like this dismissive term. But anyways, uh, Carolina, how are you today? Hey, Satori. Hey, Adam. I'm good. Thanks for having me again. I'm pretty excited about this theme. And, you know, it's something I always want to talk about. I feel uh, the psychedelic, or in this case, the entheogenic closet is still something out there that most of us have experienced or experience at some point and i'm more than happy to talk to about this today yeah it's definitely something i think we're we're in this for lack of a better word uh, a psychedelic uh, renaissance with uh, new research that's going on that's something that adam touched on and on his show and there's just yeah. this whole yeah you want to say something adam yeah, I mean, uh, it, that that's what's kind of blowing me away these uh, this last few years is, is just uh, the way that psychedelics have come back into the mainstream media. Um, there's lots more research being done on them. You know, there's uh, articles that I've seen uh, about uh, MDMA as being used for PTSD. I've seen uh, uh, initiations where mushrooms might be legalized in California and Oregon. I've seen... Uh, different studies crowdfunded uh, on on LSD in the brain. This is stuff that 10 years ago, if you would have told me this kind of research was happening happening legally, I, I, I wouldn't have believed you. I mean, it's uh, there's so many forces kind of trying to keep this knowledge uh, buried because, uh, you know, if you can cure yourself, you don't need to go see the doctors and uh, get involved in the whole pharmaceuticals and prescriptions and uh, you know they don't want to tr cure people they want to treat symptoms so that the symptoms are always need to be treated and never go away you know I I'm just really excited that uh, this type of research has been taking place lately and um, I've been able to crowdfund it <laughs> even you know that that amazes me uh, just the concept of crowdfunding amazes me on its own but uh, when it can be used towards something like uh, funding psychedelic scientific research, that's that's incredible. So I'd lo I'd love to know what you guys think about this and how, how you guys have been following these events, these 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 studies and things like that. You know, have, have you guys been paying attention to that a lot? Yeah, I have. Um, you know, I was reading this article recently, and I didn't know I knew that Maps, um, which is a great organization, and they have uh, raised a, around $20 million to help fund all sorts of different studies. They're doing MDMA research right now and all sorts of different stuff with medical marijuana. The same thing um, they right now here in California, I'm, I'm in California, they want to get this petition so they can have in 2018 on the ballot to see if they can legalize uh, psilocybin mushrooms, which I think is crazy like exactly what you were saying like just even five years ago if you would have told me that mushrooms would be legal here or at least there's it's a possibility of having this discussion and I, what i find fascinating is that it's becoming more and more legitimate i think the more and more uh we kind of come out of that psychedelic closet as uh carolina kind of mentioned a little earlier 
and the more and more we kind of talk like there's this great um event that they have i forgot what organization does it but it's basically called coming out of the psychedelic closet and it's basically having these dinners and it's kind of like a you know meet up like this meet up where you kind of like oh we're interested in this sh- subject but people basically just have a dinner and you kind of like come with like-minded people and you kind of like share your stories and you know because what you said on uh, Adam what you said in uh, your show about when you were younger and you were interested and you kind of wanted to take LSD and then your friends and nor could you say it to your your family oh I'm going to take LSD <laughs> or your friends are like well, you're crazy I had a similar experience like it was like this very taboo thing for me to even think about like taking mushrooms or whatever I was slow to it my my friend that I really admired um he kind of like well just mentioned he didn't like say oh you need to take it but he just mentioned like gave me books gave me artwork and everything and I was like dude like all these people that I'm reading and listening to they had this experience and they're not like crazy I read more into it and when I when I had my first um, experience uh, taking mushrooms, it really kind of like it was, I didn't have that the mystical experience of which we'll get into a little bit later, but when I kind of first took it, like it was this exciting thing that I I wish I could like share with people, but it was like something that I knew that uh, I needed to kind of keep to myself a little bit. But I think now there's still a little bit of um, this, this stigma to it, but I think what's happening on the internet in a way is this kind of like testing ground waiting ground that you kind of let your freak uh flag fly a little bit more and it's it's a little bit easier but i think it's getting us used to this uh concept and that hopefully within our our lifetimes we there could be a legitimate viable using these uh, ethogens to kind of like help educate us and this is where i kind of want to get into a little bit more but they, they were used these plant medicines and, and teachers were used to uh, integrate people into the tribe. And really, when you were in adolescence and you're about to be a full member of the community, you went on a vision quest. You did the, the Joseph Campbell's hero journey. And I knew from my own personal experience, I was starting for that, even though I didn't know fully what it was. But I had this intuitive instinction to do that. And maybe, you know, early on, I did it in wrong ways as well, like going to uh, backyard gigs and getting drunk and, you know, doing these kind of adolescent things. But I think that that unconscious desire was to get to this um, to this place to to express this kind of coming to this community. And I think that if we're humanity is going to keep on evolving and and having a better place on on this earth that this uh, tool is kind of very important and valuable to us i think uh, carolina you want to touch on that because i think that's kind of where you come from too in this respect yeah for sure i feel what you were just talking about coming out of this psychedelic closet has a lot to do if not everything with how we've uh, put everything on their terminology and what we are going to talk about the difference in between saying oh I'm using a psychedelic, a psychotropic, a entheogen, a mind conductive uh, substance all these different words are going to make a difference on the people that we're sharing these experiences with and what they think about them and you know, we all come for diff- from different places. I think it's quite interesting how some words are more suitable for some uh, personalities or for some souls. And depending on which words we use and how we communicate things, people are going to understand them different. And I think that has lots to do with with reaching the other one and being able to communicate with them, even though, you know, at the end, it's just another game words. But it's such an important one that I that I really appreciate that we're taking the time to to talk about these different things and why they're different if they could at the end mean something which is the same, which is connecting to your consciousness and learning more about it in order to expand it more. One word that I think needs to be associated with these types of things is the word medicine, because that's what it is. It's medicine. 
It's medicine for your soul. It's medicine for your mind. It's medicine for your body. It's medicine for your spirit. And it's an ancient medicine. It's been used as medicine for thousands of years. It's a medicine for the people, for the tribe. It's, it's a medicine that makes you connected with the rest of the world around you. And it has healing purposes and healing and, and the results are often healing and healing and medicine. These are words that need to be associated with these types of things because when you use words like psychedelics or hallucinogens, you're just a druggie. And 90% of the world won't care what you have to say because they've already tuned out because they heard you, a druggie talking. So for these types of things to really reach the masses and for these things to, to get accepted, we need to use terminology that isn't associated with the drug world. I like the word entheogen, but the word entheogen is also esoteric and mystical and, you know, the average person doesn't know what it means, but everybody knows what medicine means. Medical, medicinal marijuana. When you call it medicinal marijuana, all of a sudden that changes the whole the whole connotation of what marijuana is and we need to start using words like medicinal mushrooms and medicinal ayahuasca or whatever maybe not medicinal you know but even in ayahuasca culture i know a lot of people they call it la medicina the medicine a lot of spanish people they call peyote the medicine la medicina so you know i think these these are words that need to start being thrown around a bit more because these are words that the other 90% of the population will respond to and may, maybe that can be a foot in the door for them to, to research a little bit further about them. And I, I think I'll, I'll go into my little spiel about kind of the background to these uh, terms, how they kind of develop. So what's in the name? Uh, we have different terms for psychedelics. Hallucinogen, ethanogen, these are words that you use to describe mind manifesting substances like psilocybin, ayahuasca, DMT, um, LSD. While they are similar, they do have some important and illuminating distinctions. Each of these terms describe the effects of consciousness, of consciousness altering in a slightly different way, and some pointing to dangers and fertility, but others describing revelations or even contact with the divine. The true meaning of psychedelic and these words give us a fascinating insight into how we relate to the understanding of these compounds and the visionary states they produce. So the first term is psychedelic. The word psychedelic was coined by the pioneer Dr. Humphrey Osmond in 1957, who was the first among the medical professionals to use the word psychedelic for LSD. He did addiction recovery treatment and the study of schizophrenia. Osmond chose these words based on the synthesis of two Greek words, psyche, meaning mind, and delios, meaning manifesting. The meaning of the word literally means mind manifesting. This is a catch-all term, served very well for describing the substances that didn't affect the body but manifested amazing and mysterious changes in consciousness itself. To this day, it is still the most popular word that's used uh, for describing conscious altering substances. Hallucinogen is a term often used interchangeably with psychedelics, but it has an important uh, difference. Uh, the hallucinogen, of course, refers to a substance that produces hallucinations, which are defined as perceptions of visible sensory phenomena that, that, that seems real but is not actually there. Some psychedelics can produce hallucinations. Hallucinations themselves can come from a variety of cases, including sleep deprivation, addiction withdrawal, mental disorders, and so on. The important distinction between hallucinogen and psychedelic. The experience of that hallucination in and of itself is um, disturbing and have little to no value to the person who experiences it, while psychedelic experience, generally speaking, has a con connotation of having an inherent value or, or meaning, deep meaning. And um, for me, psychedelic is, doesn't have a negative connotation to it and that the work that MAPS and all these other organizations doing with uh, psychedelic research and using the kind of regaining the, the term but ethiogen come from Gordon Watson in, in 1979 and they were kind of working more with the plant medicines as you were mentioning and they wanted to create a new term and the term means bringing about the divine within 
And to me, the distinction that I usually make, psychedelics kind of encompassed the whole uh, mind altering uh, chemicals, LSD, M- MDMA, uh, psilocybin, DMT, uh, mescaline. But for me, ethogens are more the plant teachers. And there's a slight difference in my own mind and my own experience between these plant teachers, the plant medicines that have ancient traditions of taking the mushrooms, uh, ayahuasca, uh, peyote, San Pedro. These have a different tradition, but they do, and people that maybe aren't in the know, have that kind of esoteric kind of like, oh, sh- a shamanic kind of mystical thing. What's happening now, what I really like when I look at different studies is this, I've kind of uh, co-opted something um, John F. Kennedy said once. He said, if more politicians knew poetry and more poets knew politics, I'm convinced the world would be a lot better place. And I branch that out to, if more scientists knew poetry and more poets knew science, I'm convinced the world would be a lot better place. And I think what I get most excited about is when you blend the two worlds of people that have, say, the uh, some of the traditional knowledge and the insights and mixing that with the new renaissance of the of the science and having both sides and i think that everybody's journey is a little different but to get to a certain point where you want to start integrating is a is a word that i like to use you find this out within yourself and you don't necessarily have to take the the plant medicine route but i think the integration is integrating this uh both sides of the human being uh young used to say say about the me- uh, masculine and, and the feminine that we all have these aspects and the feminine is more of the intuitive emotional holistic knowledge and the masculine is more of the analytical and planning out and that side of the knowledge and when you're able to to integrate both of that that's when you become a fully human being and i think at the world at large and what we're wrestling with is this integration of both where we have this holistic knowledge of the whole system of what it means to be a human on this earth and but also to being able to use our our scientific knowledge to be able to integrate that on these large scales that we're at and um i'm always come from that kind of camp of uh de facto nature and I, i partly due to my own explorations with um, mushrooms. This is how a being can change. There's a worm addicted to eating grape leaves. Suddenly, she wakes up, call it grace, whatever, something wakes her and she's no longer a worm. She's an entire vineyard, and the orchard too, the fruit, the trunks, a growing wisdom and joy that doesn't need to devour. I, I am hesitant about bringing up religion or, or some kind of belief system of of shamanism or whatever into somebody that, like, if you say that to a certain type of person, then it's going to shut them down. And But also, too, I think, too, it gets tricky, and this comes to everybody's own experience and intuition of reading people and, and being able to communicate. Because at certain times, in certain ways, to use different words and different ways trying to always get to that that point because also too what i found interesting and i i totally believe this is called you know the set and setting which is most one of the most important uh timothy leary said that it was like 99 percent of what your psychedelic experience was going to be is set and setting so you know two aspects of the set and setting is the set is like your mindset of what your own internal dialogue and and how you're feeling and the setting is actual physical location 
and right. everything that is there. And but there's this uh, meta set and setting of our culture where we're in that how you f- even frame it to somebody is how th- how their experience is going to be. And this one guy said he was doing this research of um, looking back at the old studies and just by calling it uh, a hallucinogen and, and studying it for uh, psychosis, that they induce psychosis into these unwilling patients like uh, prisoners back in the 50s when they were doing it. And so, you know, their, their preconceived notion of it manifests the results of it. And the same thing with when they said, oh, this is going to expand your, your consciousness and you had more willing subjects going into it, like artists or, or scientists or, or college students. And then they had a great experience with it. And this is so very true. And you were going to say something, Adam? Yeah, I mean, that that's kind of why I think uh, the language that gets used about these things is, is, is somewhat important if we, we want to see them be accepted in more in mainstream culture. Because, um, you know, what, what I'm seeing happen with, with the science that's happening, with studies actually happening where there's, you know, X amount of participants, they get followed for X amount of time after with a double blind study where so people don't know if they're getting the placebo or the substance. So when you do studies like that, at the end of the study, you can say 100 people took it, 86 people said they felt better. That's a fact. That takes it out of the realm of psychedelic and hoodoo and druggy stuff and that makes it science and that's what needs to be in my opinion that's what is the most fascinating and most amazing thing that i'm seeing happen is these things are being experienced by people who understand that who understand that for these things to get out into the mainstream and be accepted the language around them needs to be changed and by changing the language around them you're going to get more people interested into them when when you use the word hallucinogen the person the scientific type of person who's going to be interested in it is somebody who's studying things like psychosis when you use the word entheogen now all of a sudden somebody who's maybe studying the experience of divinity a scientist who's studying prayer you know how prayer affects the brain is might be interested in it whereas if you call them a hallucinogen that scientist wouldn't even think twice about studying them so that's why i think when when you use a word like medicine or healing now all of a sudden you might get the type of scientists that are going to be able to get studies done that will bring these substances to the people that really can benefit from them that maybe would be too scared to use them because of legal reasons or maybe would just you know not feel comfortable about the whole situation around them because for decades they've been demonized in the media so um, so to me this is the most fascinating thing that's happening these days with psychedelic me personally i'm not as verbal a person like I, for me poetry and stuff like that doesn't or even song lyrics doesn't resonate with me that much as as a piece of art does and i think that's where where i come at the situation of of trying to express my experiences of of infinity or whatever you want to call it that's what i try and express with my mandalas that um that spiritual experience that i had is what i try to express that each person has that dot in the middle like my mandalas all start with a dot in the middle and we all have that we all have that connection to everything else around us whatever happens as the circumstances in an individual person's life that creates the pattern around them all the patterns of their thoughts of you know what kind of things they buy and what they're interested in you know all that kind of stuff comes comes after that dot but that dot is something that that we all have in common and that's that's the type of spiritual experience that i had and i think that there's a lot of people running around on this planet that just don't have that connection do not feel the connection to the rest of of creation and it's that lack of connection that makes people do things that harm themselves the earth society and it they're not even aware of all the damage that they're causing you know people uh, people take their car five minutes down the street to go buy milk when they could go walk you know things little things like that 
And um, that's the kind of thing that psychedelics open me up to. And that's the type of things that they help me heal with. And that's the type of thing that changed my life. You know, it made me less of a consumer and less of a, less, I cared less about uh, what other people thought of me. And I wasn't living to impress everyone around me. I, I was living more to, to satisfy my own soul, if that makes sense. Hey, Adam, I, was, I wanted to say that I didn't know you you started your mandalas from the center on. That's exactly the same thing that I do. Always start from the middle, not knowing where things are going, and they just start leading me through the whale while I'm thinking inside my mind. And that's great. I feel that's your own entheogen there. And just yeah. like you, just like you, I also have a hard time fighting over terminology as I'm just like you, more of a hands-on person. But I don't know, in the past year maybe, I've started to understand that the importance of words as they are very useful tools to communicating spe specific things or specific feelings. And at the same time, I always have in the back of my mind what this philosopher said, uh, this is Kierkegaard, I'm not sure how to pronounce his last name, but he's the one that said, when you name me, you negate me. And words are doing that. They have very specific meanings for many specific things. And that makes me feel and think that they are negating further aspects. And they, they are the tools that shape our reality. So the fact that they are negating so many other dimensions and aspects from every feeling is shaping our reality in a more uh, descriptive way. And you guys know that there is more to our reality than what we can say in words. This always brings me back to thinking that psychedelics or entheogens, anything that has been uh, classified as illegal or as a drug at some point has a very bad reputation out there. and. I think that the fact that we want to let the world know that there is much more to these substances than what the media says out there, we need to have the best PR and the best advertising for psychedelics. So yes, maybe changing the words for something like entheogen will make uh, people take a look, just like Adam was saying, yeah, maybe a scientist will never look or think twice about studying a hallucinogen because of the stigma that that word needs. I feel right now what we need to do is have all the tools, all the best ways to approach others. And once that people start having their own uh, consciousness or true self experiences, they will at the end understand that the terminology is not important and that experiencing is the important thing. And Just like Adam was saying, the important thing is starting to realize that we are nature and we need to take care of the planet. But I don't know, uh, silly worlds like the words might be what planet Earth needs right now in order to make people understand. Then again, there we all come from different places. So I don't know, a teenage girl or boy might be drawn into trying something that they hear it's a hallucinogen while they think something like Reiki is, you know, woo-woo and stupid. And the other way around, for my mom, maybe if I tell her that I'm going to give her a drug will be different than if I ask her if she wants to go in an ayahuasca retreat in the jungle of our country or if she wants to try yoga or meditation. It's so good that all these substances come in different forms that they, one of them will be suitable for a specific person And at the end, we'll realize that they are all the same, just they have different messages, but they are all trying to connect us to our own self, which is the most important part of it all. Yeah, I mean, I love these these little um, stories. Even when I was a little kid, even before I really fully realized it, and the stories are always similar in the respect that, um, there's so there's two types of, of roads generally speaking, two types of roads to enlightenment in the Zen tradition. And one is you, you look outside and you do these like menial tasks of raking like sand or uh, clipping the, 
the bonsai tree or doing these kind of like physical tasks and and you and it's part of your 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 practice and and you get really involved with it like it has to be a certain way has to be this way and you're gonna you're gonna get enlightenment and then the other path is like the inner path um where you med you sit and you meditate and, and you do these uh, uh mantras and you have all these different things that you do and in the beginning they they make sure that it's really regimented and you have we have all these different story types of people going in there and you know going to the monastery and shave your head and, and it's really disciplined and ultimately you find out that all of these are kind of like tricks to get you in to whatever personality type you're in but it's leading to all these roads and that you finally realize that none of this not not that it doesn't matter but it does it doesn't matter in the sense that there's a, a correct formula to get there because it's it's there that the direct experience of life is where it's at and that's what my um experience that i had when i say that i had the felt experience of of being a part of gaia that was like my experience of what i realized was that i, I was what whatever i'm doing is that that beauty that leaks out in my my direct experience of everything is where where it's at and then i think what my my further integration of it for my own personal of skill set is how to communicate that in different ways in order for it to be heard by different people and this is why i'm kind of like always fascinated with doing different shows and and i had this dream what it told me um uh, actually i told myself giving this speech at this hip hop festival of why can't you say something deep and have a dope ass beat and to me later when i started to really reflect on that why can't we make this healing this new uh renaissance or evolution of what we're all touching on attractive fun cuz they or or the lesser angels of the human nature have co-opted uh humanity and they've been really good at making it stylistic of they co-opted the word psychedelic and they made it this kind of cartoon cheesy thing but it did, in a sense what what carolina was kind of saying and it comes to my mind it doesn't necessarily matter because for even when i was like younger and people might get attracted to to adam's work or your work or they might hear a song and they don't even know why they really want to go back to it again and again and because it has some level of that truth and i use this term that i was banging my head against reality i kept on banging my head against reality it's a lot like those monks uh whether they're doing their the physical menial tasks or they're doing their inner work and they keep on banging their head against that reality until suddenly something happens call it the divine grace kind of what what rumi was talking about that worm and he wakes up and he realizes that the outer and inner world are connected they're mirror images of each other that this beauty of everything leaks out through everything and this is why i get attracted to both of you guys work and this is why we never really uh met each other but you know like oh so dory do you does kind of cool stuff and and you do kind of cool stuff yeah it sounds cool like let's 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 do it let's let's keep on doing different things and i think we're all getting used to this and i think even younger kids in in a very kind of scary way are more inclined to do this kind of like connective stuff but if we could get our collective group together and i think this is what's happening with the psychedelic renaissance and we have some guidance of using the archaic knowledge and the new scientific knowledge and having the best of both worlds and using that because it is necessary doesn't matter the path as long as it's the path of heart that they're all leading and all expressing the same thing in in all its very magnitude of stuff now here's something else i think that I, i'd like to maybe bring up is um places for people who've had these experiences to gather 
and reflect and share about their experiences in a non-judgmental way. Like, um, I don't know if either of you have ever been to Alex and Allison Gray's Cosm in New York, but I've been a few times there and that blew my mind. I mean, when I walked in there for the very first time, I literally felt like I was coming home. The front door opened for me and um, I felt like I was walking home. I felt like I was meeting my family that I didn't even know I had. And um, I personally would really like to, my, my, I guess you could say like my goal, my mission long term is to have a place like Cosm. I even spoke to Alex and Allison. I joked about it with them and said I'd like to have Tazum, the Temple of Sacred Mandalas. Like they have Cosm, which stands for Chapel of Sacred Mirrors. So when I told them uh, I'd like to open a place called Tazum one day, they kind of both laughed and they were like, yeah, yeah, do it, man, do it. That's really cool. That's funny. You know, so um, so I think that there's all around the world, there's, there's people that are having these experiences and maybe they're kind of like us where they didn't feel like they could share those experiences with their family. Maybe their friends that are all getting drunk told them they're in, you're crazy for doing acid. That's a hard drug. Meanwhile, like they're passed out in the gutter. So like alcohol is not a hard drug. And um, in my own personal experience, when I first had a trip and it was a heavy one, I didn't know where to turn. I felt very alone and isolated and it was finding Alex Gray's art online and finding other people's art online that it was art and music specifically that kind of made me feel like okay I'm not alone there's all these other people having these experiences and, and have had these experiences and like I can feel a connection to them through their art and music but um to actually have community space where artists and musicians are and and you know anyone who's in scientists and whoever else is interested in these type of things can come and maybe have meetings you know i don't want to use the word religion because that's not what i'm thinking but you know more like a a temple like just a place where where you could go and, and be accepted and like i don't even know how to put that word basically I want to have my own spot like I want to I want to create a space like that can give other people that feeling that I had when I first walked into the doors at Cosm where I'm home and I've found my family and I don't have to feel like I'm a misfit anymore like I found all these people who are successful and they're living their lives and they have jobs and they do things and they're, they're, they're respected members of society who have had these experiences and they come to Cosm to share about it and joke around with each other and meet other people who, who who've experienced that type of vibe. Yeah, um, that's very similar to when we first started doing uh, Infinite Imaginarium and so in the beginning, it was uh, Nikki and Dale's kind of 24-hour Imaginarium, a day of creativity. And they're just like, um, write your own story of, of your life and your narrative. And I really like the concept. So, I mean, me being me, I went crazy with it. I made images. I did little video mixes. And I was really promoting this idea, even though I didn't totally understood what they were getting at. And, but I think the part of it was like, oh, I'm going to make it my own idea. And then, so when we had our first kind of get together, um, they said, okay, so what is your, your story? You know, like, what what is your imaginary? And so it's something that I've always played with, but this is the first time I kind of like vocally said it out loud. And it's very similar to what you said. And I kind of uh, had this, um, the way I encapsulated it was having a psychedelic bed and breakfast. <laughs> so, you know, very similar to what, you're saying it's just and I, I think as I was hearing you say it and kind of formulating my own experience um, and I, I think what overall um, I think what it is is kind of reclaiming or having back sacred spaces spaces where we could just be and express ourselves and rework thinking about wh whatever form it is our expression of this connection of what it is to be alive, what it is 
to to be human what it is to be part of the world part of this great um, legacy of life that there that there is here you know whether you have an art studio um and like uh, carolina talked about this with her and it's her own little sacred space and for for other people you know it might be a little bit more of an individual space of how they process it but i also think too that it, it could be modular in the sense that we have a communal space, but also to give people their own time to to do it out on their own. But just having this uh, unspoken, like it goes without saying that you have, you find those others, those other people that understand why you're so excited about your new artwork or so excited about your new project and why you're excited about it and just kind of get it that my new phrase that i've been using because i've been doing this but it's basically uh find the others is it's something that uh timothy leary said when when he was giving a speech in berkeley and this girl she asked timothy leary that she just took lsd and she thought she understood stuff about the world and you know how everything's connected and she wanted to know now what does she do what should she do with all this um the story that she got of what everything means and he simply said find the others and it's coupled with this newer uh, podcast that douglas russkoff did and it was uh find the others but they were talking about finding the weird or creating the weird and i remixed it in my own mind saying find the others and create the weird create that novelty create that space everybody that i like like from terrence mckenna to alex gray to uh are you serious or any of these people they talk about in one sense or another creating their own road show you know creating their own robert anton wilson said that there is a conspiracy to control the world but it's you and your friends and so it's like you and the others and um joseph campbell said about access monday is the center of the universe and everybody's their own center of that universe and it goes directly to what you guys say about your mandalas and that mandala reflects that you're that dot that's creating all of this expression of the universe and it flows out from there and uh, Carolina you wanted to say something yeah just just what Adam was saying and you Satori were saying I feel we always have this eager and we always are looking for spaces just like Cosm, which has also been a great spot for me I love going to Cosm every time that I can it's so energetic just you know you are out there and you can talk freely which is great i feel some of us feel the same way about minds and that's how we all ended up meeting each other or what satori you were saying at some point about this magic bus that would be like the on road infinite imaginarium all these spots are so necessary and i think this is the only way in which our society can become the society that we wished it was, an unfiltered, free society that is uh, navigating through our consciousness and through the depth of the unknown and our own feelings and realizing that everything around us is medicine and, you know, just dancing with reality and nature. I feel these are the spaces that we all need in order to make all the our consciousness develop so someday we can see it through our neighborhoods and in schools and i don't know if we'll ever reach there or if nature will destroy us before we keep on destroying it but we are heading there and things are changing and the fact that you know there's something going on around us is that's good the fact that we are today talking about this is great i remember once talking to alex and allison at this other very interesting space called Omega. This is also in upstate New York in Rehenbach. Um, and they were telling us about how, you know, they didn't have a community all the time. They had to find the others at some point. And they were telling us if you guys at some point want to uh, reach the others, well, start a full moon gathering in your own house, get together, maybe three people will show up. but. If they want to get together in the full moon, yeah, they might be connected to some interesting part of their consciousness or they might be in some point of learning and discovering their own selves. I have goosebumps right now because I've been wanting to do that for a while. I have a space here where I can pretty much 
um, you know, have small gatherings with, you know, 10, 15, 20 people. Um, I have enough space for that at my studio and my showroom, but uh, I really don't have anyone else to do it with. Uh, I got to be honest, when I'm uh, when I went on my art journey, um, a lot of things changed about me. For many years, um, I, I felt isolated and I couldn't talk about my psychedelic experiences with other people without being ridiculed or whatever. And uh, I ended up kind of uh, retreating into drugs and alcohol. Um, for many years, that became just the way I spent time. I just uh, couldn't face a reality where, where what I was deeply passionate about didn't resonate with anybody around me. And um, when I started on, on my art journey about five, six years, well, I guess it's been about six years now, um, most of my quote unquote friends were, weren't really friends, they were party buddies. And um, I quickly found out that uh, most of them were not my friends at all. And um, I don't know, that's that's one thing l lately that I've been been feeling compelled to do is, is to start building my own community here because uh, a lot of times I'm kind of lonely. I mean, working as an artist in my studio by myself and being on the internet and uh, doing marketing and sending out email newsletters and stuff, all of that's all stuff that I do by myself in my studio and in my office. And it's like, uh, it, it kind of it gets lonely sometimes. So, so I think that the fact that uh, you just mentioned that Alex and Allison specifically said like start full moon events in your own house like man that was the synchronicity big time for me right there to hear that come out of your mouth Carolina so so thanks for sharing that experience because it really resonated with me right right here right now I, I have goosebumps again <laughs> yeah kind of goes back to that that nexus that dot right it has to start with that that one dot to start it, getting this mandala going um you know something that carolina said in her when we had our first talk and it kind of goes into what you were saying and my own experience is very similar to you adam uh she kind of just mentioned when we talked about the our psychedelic bus and she was she she was uh, or the infinite imaginarium bus um was saying about uh you know why can't instead of like going to a bar why can't we just all like get together and like create art or talk about different things like um you know maybe not everybody's uh, secure enough or whatever and you know when she said that it kind of uh i'm always kind of like reflecting on that but it kind of was like this aha moment it was like you know that's what i was always chasing with my uh party friends was that i just wanted a space where i could express myself and i wasn't secure enough so then i, I had liquid courage to kind of like uh use that as a callus to tell my my little secret feelings but then you know it's like okay you know we we go and we we express that and we, and we share that then it's like something oh we just do that you know like as fun and it doesn't mean anything kind of like a, a hallucinogen right oh that 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 doesn't mean anything it's just something that we do to blow off steam or it's just something that happens but then when you really kind of like take ownership of that and this is when I read uh, True Hallucinations by uh, Terrence McKenna. Yeah, that's my intuitive insight is that that these what used to be kind of just like this curiosity of exploring uh, the mushroom. But there was something deeper to there was it was either a, a deeper portion of myself, a deeper nature of reality, nature itself, saying that there's something true to this. And there's something eternal, and these are these are what I will always kind of pull in toward. That's why I say I use my Allen Ginsberg little thing about beauty, because that's how how I keep my mantra of of trying to keep this uh, the divine within and, and express it out. And recently, I had this uh, dream in which it, it kind of it was two days ago actually, and it totally illustrates what you express right now, Adam. The setup was that there was this birthday party from my friend Sheena and, and back in our early 20s we were really close like we spent like every free time that we had together and we'll go around like smoking and go to the parties and she was like my partner in crime and we were like best friends for like five years and um, actually 
I had this this experience with her one time, and we did uh, mushrooms, and it was we had this where we had this shared kind of vision, and this uh, I I expressed it as our consciousness morphed into one, and we we're having the same vision, and we we're like kind of talking uh, telepathically. But anyways, towards the end of it, I told her while we we're listening to uh, Pink Floyd, and when she were here, I said, you know what? That's gonna happen to us. Like life is gonna take us different ways, and we're always going to reflect back into this moment and we're going to look up at the moon or the stars and say that we wish you were here. And this is kind of what Roger Waters was saying about Sid Barrett, but it also too is what I'm going to say about you and you're going to say about me. And I just saw it. I just saw that we were going to move, that life is going to move us away. And then and I said, you know what? It's fine that it happens because I know at least for this moment and in this, this time that we share something real, share something eternal. And then, so in the dream, I go to her her birthday, and it's like a reunion of all my friends, and they're all there, like drinking and having fun. And I just felt out of place. I didn't feel like I felt like an outsider, and I I couldn't like talk to them. I didn't really not that I couldn't talk to them, but I just wasn't what I wanted to talk about. Kind of what you were saying is not what they were talking about, and that we were just in totally different streams. And in the dream, I wasn't all right with it, but it was just this, this reflection of reconfirming this own thing to, to my own internal truth and staying true to my path with heart. And what, whatever that means, it's kind of like this, this thing that I always kind of need to like reconfirm with myself. And it's just interesting how recently in the synchronistic way, that dream has, uh, been reflected back to me because not only what, what you were saying uh, makes me reflect on that is that and I, I think too part of the, the process of, of your own development uh, Carl Jung is a, is a great resource for anybody who wants to look into uh, um, their own internal development and the concept is the dark night of the soul and this this uh, dark night of the soul I think um, I, 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 I haven't met any artist that hasn't gone through a dark night so i think this is a natural process of anybody or not even an artist but just developing as a human and i think a lot of times is you know the best way through stuff is is through it and that our our and i think this is part of like this collective whole of why we dismiss the ethiogens and, and this this uh, true hallucination of what's happening is because we don't want to uh reconcile not only our own individual stuff but uh, of, of our own uh, collective humanity work of what's going on with with our relationship with, with Gaia Young had it right that we should live part of our life internally we should do deep self-exploration which also means transformation, and then combine somehow in our everyday life the deep knowledge and wisdom that could come from these states. The transpersonal experience revealing the Earth as an intelligent, conscious entity are corroborated by scientific evidence. Gregory Bateson, who created brilliant synthesis of cybernetics, information and systems theory, the theory of evolution, anthropology and psychology, came to the conclusion that it was logically inevitable to assume that mental processes occurred at all levels in any system or natural phenomenon of sufficient complexity. He believed that mental processes are present in cells, organs, tissues, organisms, animal and human groups, ecosystems, and even the Earth and universe as a whole. This is how a being can change. There's a worm addicted to eating grape leaves. Suddenly, she wakes up. Call it grace. Whatever. Something wakes her, and she's no longer a worm. She's an entire vineyard, and the orchard too, the fruit, the trunks, 
a growing wisdom and joy that doesn't need to devour. <laughs>